We are underway. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Digital Rebar Meetup version six on December 5th from cold and windy Austin, Texas. Today, we are all broadcasting live from the uh, rack and headquarters. Um, on the line with us, we've got Steven Spector, Greg Althouse, and Victor Lauder from Racken. And we've got some of our good old stalwart community member members, uh, Will Dennis and Chris Trees. Uh, welcome, guys, and uh, appreciate you joining as usual. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, DRP 3.40 and DRP 3.41 releases that just went out the door uh, hot off the presses late, late, late last night. And then we'll talk a little bit about DRP version 3.5 planning. Uh, today we're going to have a, a kick-ass, rough and tumble, immutable Kubernetes demonstration by our own in-house, Greg Althaus. Uh, we're calling that bad boy CRID, which is Kubernetes rebar immutable bootstrapping. And then, as always, we'll get into some community feedback. And um, yeah, so that's sort of the plan for today. Uh, last week we talked about some stuff. Uh, it was cool stuff. I pull up our uh, uh, agenda from last week. We had some discussions on, on, oh yeah, we had some awesome discussions on runners and jobs. There was a lot of interest around that, and I think um, some of our community uh, fans out there are starting to get a handle on runners, jobs, and job queues. It's probably the most complex interaction and pieces and parts of digital rebar provision, which is otherwise, we like to believe, simple and easy. Well, we did make it simpler with this slate. <laughs> er, always include the er. The er. And uh, we also uh, talked a little bit about profiles and orchestration changes, which is actually the backbone of what has enabled us to extend uh, the Kubernetes immutable stuff through CRIB. And we have some other interesting uh, use cases going forward for that use case. So we're starting to see the light of day on some of these conversations we had a couple of weeks ago already. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see all of that come together. Uh, last week we had a little bit of uh, community feedback from Carl Perry on templating system stuff. And uh, Carl, if you uh, see the recording, uh, I still owe you some more documentation on the Golang templating. If you haven't found what we currently have in the Read the Docs documentation, there is some information in there already, but I'm uh, endeavoring to extend and uh, upgrade and add more value to that. So uh, look forward to that still coming up. I haven't forgotten about you. Um, that's it from last week's uh, uh, meetup. Let's go ahead and hand the controls over to Greg. And Greg, if you want to go ahead and uh, share your screen here or not. Oh, there we go. We got him kicking over to share a screen. You have to, you have to release. You have to, I, have to release. release. I don't want to release control. I must pass. I must release control. Uh, disable attendee mode stop. annotation. Uh, I need to just stop. Stop, stop, share. stop share. I can stop share. No more share. All yours. All right. Let's see. Does it all show up? Yep. Cool. All right. So. Can you make your window bigger? Oh my gosh. These guys like, are so like. Look at that, man. Like, Come on. Blind and. I challenge. Three. All right, fine. All right. There you go. All right. Better. So um, I'm going to talk about our crib oh. set. Uh, it's a new content pack that's out there. Uh, you may have to find it in the catalog. Um, basically, it's kind of a second pass at doing Kubernetes in a different way. Um, this one is interesting because it uses the Kube Atom community tools. And so we're not using the Ansible stuff. This is just run Kubernetes and have it come up. And so to do that, we take advantage of a couple of uh, the new features in 3.4. We've made um, atomic operations easier to use from the CLI. And so this takes advantage of that in the tasks so that it can allocate a master and get parameters in a uh, consistent way. So what we'll do is just kind of show a demo. I have six machines out here. I'm going to set up two Kubernetes 
uh, clusters. To do that, what I have to do first is create two, uh, a profile. So I'm going to do a RAM only version. It turns out the way we've got this implemented is you can actually run it, run it in Sledgehammer. Uh, we don't necessarily recommend this for production, but you know, uh, it's a good way to play with it and see, and it's pretty fast. And then you can also use it to uh, on the install systems, but to do that, you have to have a runner. The only requirement is that you create a profile that has cluster profile, crib cluster profile as a parameter, and that has the name of that profile as its value, okay? And so I have two of those, and I've kind of already set them up on the machines. And so what I'm gonna do is I'll just get them started, and then we can talk about it. So for the first three, I'm gonna put them into, they're my RAM only version. Like, let that go there. I can see those are the ones I've already assigned the profiles to the machine. So that they're, they're in it, and I will kick off my RAM only ones by using the mount local disk stage. And because they're already sitting in Sledgehammer, you'll see they'll just start running it. Um, what Crib provides is three stages. And actually, let me start the other ones going too, since these take even longer. For these, I'm gonna start a CentOS 7 install. And because um, I need them to reboot, them using packet. These are all living on a packet. So they're off and, and running. So if I look at my workflow for what I'm trying to do, I actually put the workflows in the um, profile so that they can be specific to the ones in question. So we provide three new stages in crib. One is mount local disks. That's basically for the RAM only case so that the Docker file system can be using a local disk. So it blows away the first disk of the system and remounts it as an XFS file system and sets it up for Docker to use as its backing store for its containers. So then we install Docker. Once that's done, done we'll actually do the crib install. The crib install is actually a task that's backed by our Crib install template, and it does things like make sure that we have the various base components installed. This works for both CentOS and Ubuntu. Make sure that all of the Kubeatom requirements are in place, and then it will use the DRP CLI to elect a master using our atomic operations. So the first one that gets to this point claims man claims itself as master, and then if it becomes master, it goes through and runs kubeatom init. And there's lots of ways we could enhance the configurability of this. It's kind of as a, let's see where this goes kind of project. We'll start Calico as the networking subsystem. And then again, right back in DRP, the command needed for all the clients to join. The clients or minions or workers or whatever term you want to use for Kubernetes um, will sit there and spin waiting for those other pieces to come up. And once they're complete, they'll see, they'll get their command and then they'll run the command to join. And when they're all done, the, the systems will sit in Sledgehammer uh, wait, um, indicating that they're done. As always, the job system will show us what's going on. So we can see we've already installed Docker on the systems, right? They went through, installed their stuff. And in the process, they're running the crib install. Um, we can go look at the profile and see who won master. So in this case, master is 56cc. So the master was dynamically elected. Then. Correct. So of those three nodes, I could have put into the profile, if I knew which the UUID of the one I wanted to be master, I could have added it directly as that and it would have made that one the master. Since um, it was empty, the task and then went ahead and just selected one of the nodes that ran. That's right. They all uh, tried to, they they all all race, tried to claim master. Race to so, master. Uh, use the topic parameter setting to guarantee that only one of them actually got it. Right. 
So you can see the master finished. It added the join command. If I go look at the jobs, they're all done. So if I check my machine's overview, they're all on sledgehammer way. And it said 56cc. So if I SSH into this guy, and I'm in. And then if I export my food config, I have my credentials, food cuddle, get nodes. And there we are. I have a Kubernetes cluster. All the nodes, I have two ma uh, one master and two other nodes joined in and they're ready to go. I can also check and see what pods are running and see that, um, actually I have, looks like one of the pods is almost all up, but otherwise they're up and running and complete. So the system is up and chugging along, waiting for people to inject additional containers which is a, a markedly um, faster install experience, setup experience than uh, when we were using the Coop Spray Ansible uh, playbooks, which was 20 to 30 minutes to get to uh, up and ready soon. That's right. And let's see, let's see if these are still often moving them back their way. Okay. Oh, oops. Uh, uh, so the CentOS ones are going to do the same thing. And then in this case, the workflow for them looks more like our traditional OS install. So in this case, I'm going to do an OS install. It takes a while. We then do our packet SSH keys. We put a runner to run after the install completes to finish the install. And apparently we can't go see all those. Way. A little bit of a rendering. Anyway, I guess we'll work on that at some point. So on, on these uh, profiles, you have two sets of profiles, uh, stages, flow. Uh, presumably the, the bottom stage, uh, the three to sledge out late is our initial holding pattern mm -hmm. and then we kick off from there for the actual install of seven. Right. seven. Whereas the uh, Kubernetes in memory stuff is just doing it in sledge out late. Correct. So there's Right, so this, this path requires three reboots um, to get to where you're done. Um, I think I forgot a stage, so I'm back up to maybe that. Maybe this doesn't show it. Uh, maybe there. Something else to deal with rendering. The idea is that um, because workflows reuse stages, um, I put them into their profiles so that they could have independent stages from each other. That rendering issue is because we only do six or seven iterations, I think, over the, um, yeah, the stage, table. stage table. Yeah. So the idea here is that um, I put the discover ones in here so that the nodes, if they ever rebooted or I wanted to reimage them, they could go through the discovery process because of the way profile parameters work. These override the ones in global. So this is my global one. If nobody has anything, they'll get discovered. But once I assign the profile, the profile also contains the follow-on workflow. So that's the idea. Uh, we don't have to wait for the uh, other nodes to finish installing and stuff. But the idea is that it works the same way, works in the same environment, and should show up the same way eventually. So I'm, I'm super excited about this because this is a, a really cool pattern for immutable container. Uh, management, um, specifically in this case, Kubernetes. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, since the uh, um, stage that installs Kubernetes could be pretty much anything. Um, but what um, I see really fascinating use case for this is going forward as function as a service slash, uh, I'm gonna try not to bar saying this, serverless, though fast and serverless uh, use cases where you can create dynamically scaling Kubernetes clusters that can do uh, fast uh, function as a service and serverless uh, solutions very, very quickly and allow you to be very efficient with infrastructure if you don't need to have infrastructure running. Uh, in the US, our power is so cheap, we don't tend to really worry about sleeping machines, but other parts of the world like Europe, their power is extremely uh, expensive and a lot of the European customers are very excited about the ability to sleep machines and only use infrastructure that you need uh, simply because the cost of power is so high. 
Um, but I think it's a really cool pattern, and I look forward to um, us iterating over this and fine tuning it and um, really making it kick butt and then demonstrating some uh, function of the service capabilities on it uh, going forward. Are there any other sort of interesting use cases or solutions we've thought of for this? Um, you guys want to talk about or put me on the spot? Just didn't cover this before, but. So interestingly enough, the atomic operations are also what the Terraform provider uses. It's written in Go, so it got to use some of the library functions directly. And so that's why it was able to kind of start with that pattern. Um, the Terraform provider uses it as a pooling mechanism so that it knows what machines it's allocated from pools. In. That way it can keep track of, did it already allocate a machine to somebody when they do a Terraform request? Right. Um, that's an, another use of that kind of pattern of the atomic operation. Um, and, and in general, the atomic operations are really interesting for anything that wants to do clustering in general. That has master min and master slave, uh, whatever you want to call them, um, um, patterns because somebody needs to be a master. As we saw very briefly, we can uh, elect a master by assigning it through uh, the profile, or we can just let um, the cluster race to win a master election, and then boom, the cluster comes up. And so there, that um, atomic operation is, is critical to being able to do that sort of thing, cluster operations like that. So that could be true for anything for salt stacks where you have mastering minions, from you know, Puppet, Chef, any of the uh, common uh, configuration management tools, uh, anything from any other con configurations stuff that requires coordination for master minions, all the way from uh, things like uh, uh, NoSQL clusters and stuff like that. Um, the only uh, interesting thing is managing data in terms of, um, you know, if you're just bringing hosts up and then letting hosts replicate data between services, then that's easy enough. But if you, uh, you need to start looking at draining data and, and draining content from machines, which I believe we could pretty easily add yeah. as a stage as an, an operation to drain before we destroy the machine. Yeah, so that's one of the thoughts is to start looking for a future item is to start working through the concepts around maintenance workflows, right? Where I want to scale up or scale down my Kubernetes cluster, right? I could envision a workflow that added nodes, and like you said, then remove nodes. And the trick with removing nodes is to make sure you're not just ripping applications out from under themselves. Proper draining. Proper draining. <laughs> Which can easily be implemented as a task, right? That's straightforward. Exactly. Uh, so that's awesome. I appreciate you putting that together, Greg. I know it was short notice, and I just uh, pinged you yesterday about pulling this together. Uh, and it is um, very, um, very raw, very hot off the presses. Um, Rob will be uh, talking about this in the KubeCon conference on. Do we know what time Rob's con speeches? Thursday or something. It's Friday at, I think, 11.45 a.m. Friday at 11.45 a.m. in That's some room at the Austin Convention Center. If you happen to be there, come by, check it out, and uh, let um, uh, Rob go through his demo of, of the process. So uh, looking forward to seeing all that get um, wrapped up and cleaned up as we go forward. Uh, let's talk a little bit about... Uh, DRP 340 and 341. You want to, I'll let you share. Take, take back your share. Yeah. Let's see. So there were um, 34 and 341. 341 is what's out there. We had a bug that the LAE and the community found real quick when we put it out, so we fixed that. Wrapped it. So, anytime we talk about 340, I think of it as 341. Let's see, a couple of sets of things. First, we've already talked about it a little bit. We've added Atomic Ops. The CLI now has the ability for you to save an object into a file or pass that back in and pass that back in as the reference object to make changes so that when a patch is generated, 
it'll use that reference object to make your tests to see if something's changed. And the reason that's important is the CLI right now builds a patch, but it goes and asks the DRP endpoint for the current state of the object and then generates the patch from that. So it's atomic within that range. But with this flag, it allows you to get an object at some point, make some decisions about what you want to do, and then make a change relative to the object when you got it, not what it is currently. So that way, changes can't sneak in on you. And then, um, so that's kind of the reference object flag now that's there. In addition to that, we added an add and remove parameter setting option, which are also atomic. So you can add parameters to plugins, machines, and profiles atomically and remove them as well. Let's see. And then I'll let Victor talk about some of the task work. Um, because that was a helper for machines. These are the DRT CLI focused items. Oh, yeah, getting camera range here? Well, maybe. I think this is off. Oh, oh mine's off. Awesome. Okay. So nobody's being recorded. Nobody's being recorded. All right. Well, that's, that's probably the safest option. Okay. So what I did with the task stuff is I added a couple of helpers to the machines CLI that uh, allow you to uh, insert tasks at uh, any point after the currently executing task. Um, what I'm going to be using this functionality for is implementing uh, our BIOS flashing subsystem and our RAID management stuff, um, because a large portion of that is, first we have to detect what RAID controller, what BIOS system, or you know what type of BIOS we have, and uh, from that determine what the best method is going to be to configure, the, configure that RAID controller or flash that BIOS, and um, it's easy to split that out, those out of their own individual tasks. But in order for me to not tear what remains of my hair out with the crazy JQ stuff, um, I needed some helpers in the CLI that would just let me say, insert a job or insert a new task into the machine task list right after currently running one or at some other point or insert a bunch of tasks at this point. And uh, that's what the new CLI does. That way I can just say, hey, we detected it's a Dell system, so we're gonna do Dell Flash stuff next. Or we detected it's a Super Micro, so we're gonna do Super Micro Flash stuff next. So, so there are some interesting side effects of uh, rework as well, too, in terms of uh, reduction in code and also in increasing code coverage, right? Um, so in order to get that, I really didn't want to implement it in the old CLI that we had that used the uh, Swagger auto-generated clients. Um, because the client code that the uh, Swagger package that we're using generates horrible, horrible code. Um, and so I went ahead and finished uh, a rework that I started a couple months ago um, to rewrite the CLI such that it talks to uh, kind of the native client API package that I wrote early for some earlier work. Um, that allowed me to trim about uh, six megs off of the final um, CLI binary, and uh, also add some more generic uh, wait for event stuff. For, for instance, you used to only be able to wait for uh, certain types of events that pertain to uh, machines changing and uh, being saved. Uh, now you can wait on pretty much any object that the CLI supports nice. or any change that it uh, needs to make there. Um, and I kind of uh, you know, factored out a bunch of common code and Made the made the CLI smaller and have more features at the same time. So test coverage went up too, right? So I think our test coverage is up to yeah. I did some pretty heavy refactoring on the whole on um, our entire test framework to make it uh, easier to add and remove um, more extensive tests on the CLI itself. Nice, yeah. Because we were sitting around sixty nine and a half to seventy percent of um, test coverage, and now we're pushed up to almost seventy five percent. I think is what I saw. Which is really cool because uh, Ghost has a few corner cases that are hard to test for, and so there's a number of places where we just can't really test some of the codes so that's expected. Greg promised one day he'll talk about that, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, hold him, we'll hold him to it one day, but not yeah. right now. Uh, Let's see. Additionally, we went through and changed the runner. The runner will now implicitly change stage after all the tasks are completed in its list. Um, we were noticing 
that we were building stages at pretty much every single stage, every single time that it changed stages, its last task. And that seemed like a uh, broken pattern to make everybody do that over and over again. We left the change stage task in the content, so your existing job will continue to work fine with them and stages. So it's backwards compatible in that fashion, but it's not required anymore. Um, so that that's a tweak to make things a little more, a little easier to create stages and hook them together. Uh, a side effect of this change ring is that you now have um, the features returned that uh, you used to be able to just say, like, let me set my boot environment to CentOS install, set an install, and then it'll go and boot into local and be done. Well, we kind of broke that when we first started stages. With this change, you also get that back. So now you can set the stage without creating any workflows to send us to something that ends in install, reboot the system. Once the install is finished, it will transition to the local boot environment, local stage, and, and let you actually finish your install instead of cycling forever. So that's in terms of return of function. Uh, Shane put out some doc updates and five minutes ERP updates. That was good too. There, there's more coming in that as well. Um, making a little bit more of a generic use case scenario, um, scenario than just our demo. It's actually been more than just a five minute demo use case for a long time. Yeah, At least exactly. for me, I use it quite heavily for spinning up clusters in uh, packet.net. So one of the things I look at, I'm looking to do is extend it to do things like salt stack clusters, uh, Kubernetes prep stuff and spin up a prep cluster and Pack it just instantly automatically, uh, short of the initial OS installs uh, for packet.net. So, and I have plans to hopefully get it replaced as the basis for our currently turned off um, content test subsystem. And, and on that front, I've started some work to genericize the ability to bring up multiple OS instances. Right now, it's kind of a one pony show and that it. It tends to spin up just a CentOS or an Ubuntu or actually any X instance uh, type of machine. So I'm extending it to be able to say, bring up N platforms of OS type X. And so we can actually bring up a whole matrix of every, every machine type we support and OS type we support for doing testing. Um, around that, we also picked up some security bug fixes. Uh, we've heard complaints of some scans not necessarily passing if you have some cipher tests on. So we removed triple DES from our default cipher set in RC4. Yeah, RC4 is gone too. As well, those are known to be weak and in general cause you to fail your PCI audits. So we pulled those out. Um, there's been some fixes to the UX around editing. There's always more sharp edges there, but it is slowly getting better. There's also the beginnings of some auto update, auto refresh kind of features based upon events that are beginning to show up in some pages. Generally, there were, there were a number of other fixes. I didn't capture most of them in the UI. Um, I believe we've added uh, name change support. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that's added, explicit. That right. came from Will, so. <laughs> yeah, so Will, there you go. Uh, you can change the name in the UX now. Um, complain to us loudly as you always do which we appreciate if you run into any problems with that. And then we also added, um, there are a couple other things that were. Yeah, oh, the machines picked up some task views. That's so right. you can actually see what tasks are currently in a list and running. Um, so just wander around and look. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, and we fixed a bug which, Hopefully none of y'all saw that Victor and I were starting to see where tasks, there were some edge cases for tasks that you could get a task kind of stuck, which would cause the runner to not run, and then a few other kind of edge cases. And those are all in 3.4. And then 3.4.1 last night, we pulled in the ability for you to use um, URL-based names or local file names on the create and update options. 
And that's on the CLI. On the CLI, CLI only, these are CLI, that's a CLI option. And then um, to help with some of the community support stuff we've been finding with like explode ISO sometimes needing to be tweaked, we added the embedded assets override, which is basically a directory that you can put copies of the things that are embedded in DRP that get exploded. And if they're present in that directory, we will override and use those instead of the ones actually inside the ERP itself. That way, if you needed to just play with uh, what's going on with Explode ISO, you can, and not worry about it getting overwritten. Actually, or if you need a custom iPixie for whatever reason, or yeah, any, of that, any of those sorts of tools. Yeah, exactly. So that helps extend in a number of different ways. And then the, the main reason for 341, because those would have showed up in Remumble, the next release, <laughs> was that, uh, LAE found a uh, startup issue where the machines, objects, we expected to have a meta structure in them, in them. and up until 3.3, we didn't make sure that those were in there, and so if your objects existed before 3.3, you actually could have operated fine without a meta structure um, because of a bug in 3.4, we would explode. So I fixed that, so now um, your previous objects will work and eventually over time we'll pick up empty meta structures, so, which is fine. I mean, it's, it's the migration path that should have been there. Be. So. Okay, so that kind of wraps up 340, 341. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit briefly about 35 planning and I have somewhere around here uh, issues. Yes, 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 I'll give you lots of money. Um, no, not issues. We don't want issues. We have no issues. Um, how would I get there? Project. Project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, DRP version planning. Yeah, I think. Not forward. All right. So, with, as you can see, we knocked out our to do column. Uh, in a mad dash in the last few days to clean up and uh, finish a number of things that were either long running processes or uh, adding sort of the uh, embedded assets in the enable local file system, HTTP, HTTPS, uh, to pass JSON blobs into the CLI. Uh, that's one of my favorite things because I, I use the CLI heavily and I like that um, to be able to stage content. Um, did So did you use a generic library for that or is it just it turns out, um, for the most part, um, you can just call HTTP get with the URI. Okay, so because you can't, the one thing you can't do that you might think about doing is do like file colons, blah blah. Right. That form not supported. But, but you can you pass, pass a record, path. It'll, it'll, work. it'll work. Path or file. Now, what about um, references like get colon? No, no, okay. no. That won't. That'll be my next request. Okay. Good minute. luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. We'll deal with that later. But right now, no. It'll just do HTTP, HTTPS, um, local file system paths, dash for standard in, and then it'll try and treat it as a blog or JSON or you know, after that. Great. I'll get some uh, documentation updated around those enhancements as well uh, in the next few days. Well, probably not in the next few days because uh, we have KubeCon and Cloud NativeCon. On the next three days here in Austin. Um, but so, what are we thinking about for 3.5? We've got, um, we've only got two, three tickets sitting in the backlog right now. Um, um, one thing that I've added that's not in the backlog, but that's already been pulled into TIP, oh, yeah. is um, default values for parameters. Okay. Um, in parameters now, uh, if you have a JSON schema, one of the optional fields in that is uh, default. And I've uh, made the internals aware of that field if it's present, so we can provide um, default values for some of our more complex parameters. Okay. And, uh, for bias settings, that basically boils down to a gigantic list of here's the setting you want to set, and here's what you want to set it to. And um, forcing people to build that all on their own without any reference is kind of too much to ask. So I'll okay. provide something that acts both as uh, same defaults for a few different systems and as an example of how to build it. And so do we have an issue for that currently or an enhancement? No, it's probably already through. It's already been through as a protocol. So 
We'll add a new we'll, we'll add, we'll add and stream and drop it. Yeah. Yeah. The other use for this is actually within uh, to simplify template construction. So you'll see in a lot of places where we'll do things like if this parameter exists, do this, else, here's some weird string. Yep, yep. And one of the problems that that's kind of caused to arise is we can get like the default password for the OS is out of sync across the boot environment if we forget to update it. But this ding, allows ding, ding. Yeah. So what this allows us to do is to default that value inside the parameter itself to rocket skates. So they might yeah, run. we'll run. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's up to y'all to set something real in the global uh, profile. Right. But that way, then, the, but that allows the template to get rid of the if this then else kind of pattern. Okay. And it would just be expand this parameter. Nice. Okay. So that's a, a nice side effect uh, beyond what Victor was going to use it for, that it helps us clean up the template. We haven't made the template changes clean up, to clean that up yet. Yeah. Um, that's coming in one day. I also no noticed uh, going through the grid stuff that uh, some of the, the stuff I pushed in for task list manipulation could be used in uh, in lieu of a gigantic you know if blah else blah yeah. uh, right. switches inside of the tasks themselves. Yeah, that's right. Okay. You can decompose those and then do selective uh, uh, joins. And, and so that task. one has yeah. been pushed in a tip already. We just need to retroactively use it off. Um, the task list is actually in three four. No, no, yeah, the task list is three four though. The default parameters, default parameters right. right. And it's a tip, but not in a Lucy. Okay. So uh, Victor's on the hook for that. He said he'll do it in five minutes as soon as we get done. Docs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So moving forward to uh, 3.5, um, we've got sitting in our backlog queue update the plugin model, which I believe is a fairly decent sized chunk of work. Um, mm -hmm. We have some ideas on that already. We do. But um, um, we haven't really have we done any work tackling on it yet. It's more of it getting to the critical mass of annoyance, like what happened right. with the API rerun. It would be nice someday we'll get to it, and one day we'll be like, yeah, damn it, we need this. Well, there's some, there's some issues that we would like to address with it, um, but right now it's, it's floating along, gathering kind of mental momentum. Okay. Uh, in reality, there's a set of things that we're kind of doing on the side, which aren't necessarily direct DRP uh, changes. For example, Victor, like we said, is kind of working on porting over our DRPV2, RAID, BIOS, and those kind of functions. Um, those aren't necessarily direct community accessible. Right. So that's why it may look like we're not doing much here. Um, we're also contemplating trying to get the Terraform provider actually into HashiCore and have them publish and, and well, send out. We're actually doing more than content. Yeah, okay, so we're working on that. We're actually working on that, right? So, so that's one of the things Greg that's is saying contemplated because he's on the hook to write a test framework for it. Because that's what I'm working on now, yes. right? So in some regards, there's not going to be direct items that are directly associated with DRP kind of within the context of core. Um, I'd expect to see things like the Terraform content show up as a something parallel to crib. Right. Um, I'd expect to see DRP uh, at least uh, Terraform provider show up, uh, hopefully, I'm not sure, timeline uh, out in HashiCore's kind of tool set. Uh, but to do that, we need to spend some time uh, updating it and writing any test for it and getting it through HashiCore's acceptance kind of process. So that's kind of the more pressing items that are kind of going on on the team's work. We'd love to hear right, what people think or feedback. feedback yeah. so some of the other things that we've been working on in the background that hasn't really surfaced yeah. in uh, um, community yet is we've been doing some integrations with various configuration management services, CMDBs uh, out there. And actually, I say we as sort of the royal in this case. You know, for example, uh, Device 42 is a really interesting CMDB platform. And a gentleman by the name of Will Atkinson, and uh, you may see him in the community occasionally, has been doing the integration work to uh, integrate TRP into their CMDB platform. And so it's a really interesting uh, piece for us because it, it, it kind of highlights and shows uh, one of the primary um, goals and objectives of 
uh, DRP version three is to be very integratable uh, and um, making everything uh, useful and doable from a clean, simple UI. And uh, talking to Will, um, he said he's been pretty, pretty happy um, in doing that integration because it's pretty straightforward and easy for them to do. And they're using that for doing things like uh, Victor's Go High uh, inventory stuff uh, where we can do scrape a uh, inventory and shove that back into uh, the D device 42 database. Uh, then also using device 42 to classify machines and then being able to uh, allow someone to write custom stages that can call out the device 42 and say, hey, what's my role in life? Now do this stage sort of thing, uh, sort of interaction. Um, falling out of that with some interesting work we're starting to embark on, uh, hopefully that will see some light, is uh, StackStorm, which is a really interesting tool that I'm, I, I love a lot. They're an automation framework that um, is based around the same sort of cloud-native principles and tenets uh, as uh, um, uh, Digital Rebar. And so we're starting some work with them in, in conjunction again with Will, who uses StackStorm. Uh, at uh, device 42. So we're looking at uh, some early stage work on getting a, a, what they call a pack, a content pack uh, for DRP to be integrated into StackStorm. So those are some larger orchestration and automation uh, framework uh, pieces that we're starting to see some involvement around. There are some others as well uh, that we're working on, but it, it kind of shows a general trend um, that I think is uh, very positive and reflects very positively on uh, digital rebar and our, our goal is to be cloud native and to be able to integrate both on the front end and the back end, either uh, integrating other tools to do provisioning or to be integrated and driven and automated by other tools. So um, I, I really like that and I think uh, there's some interesting stuff coming down the pipe. It'll be months probably before all of that's realized, but those are some interesting things. Okay. You also have I do. What am I doing? Uh, pull request last night. There's that Kixi. Oh yeah, yeah. So and for Will, um, actually, it was sort of a genesis for that is uh, cleaning up the uh, Kixseed stuff so that you can uh, select uh, and use either the default um, Kickstart or Preseed, uh, or you can pass in a parameter which can either be attached to a machine or to a profile or a profile attached to a machine. However, you want to use that. You can even apply that in, in global if you're doing all one OS install. But that allows you to pass in a, a custom kickstart or pre-seed that will be um, uh, allow you to do, instead of using the, the rack and uh, digital rebar provided uh, open source version of the kickstart or pre-seed, you can pass your own and use it. So that's, that's uh, in, in the process in the background right now. That should probably come out uh, not too long ago from now. Uh, the caveat being the next three days we're all pretty busy. Yeah, that's it. So it'll sense. probably be beginning of next week that that comes out uh, for sure. Um, and then, so that kind of wraps up 3.5. Um, we don't really have anything we're going to move into the to-do column right now. It gives you a, a little bit of an idea of some of the things we're working on um, as we sort of formalize this. Uh, and again, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon is going to kind of put things on a, a pause for a bit for a few days here for any major changes in work. So it'll be on Monday, Tuesday of next week before we start sort of advancing the ball, so to speak, on a number of these things. Um, with that, the only thing we have left on the agenda is community feedback, questions, and answers. Community today is Chris and uh, Will. So you guys, uh, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to talk to us about or whether we should wrap up for the day. So I'm gonna give you guys a, a a moment to shine in the spotlight if you had anything you wanted to talk about. Uh, we got a, somebody's chatting, I don't see who. Oh, that's Kat. Chris is, is he's mute again. He is mute. Kitty Cat can't find his meow. Oh. <laughs> what does he say? Is it nope. nope and always. Nope, nope and always. <laughs> <It's right. laughs> okay, Will, that leaves you. Do you have anything you wanted to bark at us about? Surprisingly, no. No! <gasps> What the oh heck? Gosh. Keep up the good work, guys. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, we're going to uh, wrap things up. Uh, as always, thank you very much uh, for showing up and listening to us uh, giggle and banter. Uh, next uh, meetup is uh, December uh, 14 days from today, which makes it the 19th. 
sure. If my math didn't uh, fail me there, and Mrs. LaFrance would be very ashamed of me if I failed that test. Um, so on the uh, 19th of December, come back before we have Christmas, uh, and uh, we look forward to talking to you all then. Thank you very much. Uh, Spectre, you can go ahead and wrap up.